Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, pleasure to see you today. Uh, my name is Roland Paris, uh, director of SIPS, and uh, it really gives, gives me a great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, John MacArthur, our, our speaker today. Uh, his bio says that he's an economist focused on interrelated issues of economic growth, technological advance, sustainability, poverty reduction, and global collaboration. But I'd say for myself, four things really stand out uh, when I think about uh, John MacArthur. Um, first is the breadth of his work, which is just hinted at in that list of areas of interest and in which you can see for yourself if you go to his website and peruse some of his, uh, even just his, what he's been writing in the last year or two. Second is uh, the intelligence of his analysis. It's smart analysis and consistently smart. Um, third is that it's simultaneously pragmatic and ambitious which is a really hard thing to pull off, but he manages to do that. And lastly, and related to the third, is uh, that he's, uh, uh, he's irrepressibly optimistic about the future, which sometimes can be hard for some of us who spend our times thinking, <laughs> time thinking about what's happening in the world. He manages to hold on to that sense of what I is possible. Uh, I think we'll get a glimpse of this today. Um, we were certainly pleased to benefit from these qualities at the Ottawa Forum, which we held in this building uh, last May. And uh, if you're interested, as I said, you can go um, to his website. You could also go to our website and look at his session on the, uh, from the Ottawa Forum. At earlier points in John's career, he has been CEO of Millennium Promise. Uh, he uh, managed the UN uh, Millennium uh, Project. Uh, he has been a faculty member at Columbia's SEPA and a uh, policy director at the University's Earth Institute, a research fellow at the Harvard Center for International Development, um, and uh, where he co-authored uh, the Global Competitive Report and uh, before that a Rhodes Scholar. Today, uh, he's, uh, you know, the list is long. So I'm not going to uh, give you all of his current titles, except to say that he's a visiting fellow, uh, a senior fellow at a number of uh, prominent institutions. And tomorrow, who knows? But uh, watch this space, because wherever he lands, you can count on him to produce interesting work. Please uh, join me in welcoming John MacArthur. Thank you so much. Merci tout le monde. Je vais parler en anglais, si vous me permettez, même si on est à Ottawa. Uh, I want to start by asking a question. And I want to ask everyone if you could please join me, because I'd like this to be a group conversation. I'm going to talk a lot, but I want us to talk together. I want to ask you to start. If you were to give the world a score, some of you have seen variants of this before, but if you were to give the world a score of how it's doing in fighting extreme poverty, on a scale of zero to 10, just come up with a number. So 10 is, we've cracked this problem, this is done. And zero is, this is getting worse, this is calamity, this is, everything's more unimaginable than you could think. And five is, huh? How would you rate it? Just everyone from zero to 10 voting with your fingers, how would you score this? Everyone around the room, if I can indulge you. I have some seven, sixes, fours, five, two, any, any ones, six, any threes, any tens? Okay. Now I'd like you to grab the person next to you <laughs> and just pick one word, if you can, to explain why you gave the score you gave. Just take 20 seconds and use one word. Go. <laughs> okay. So if we can bring it back. So some volunteers, please. What's what did your partner give? Any threes in the room? 
Who gave a three? And why, it, with your partner, why'd you give a three? Because I don't think we are doing enough prevention measures to okay. keep us from getting worse. Right. So I think if we don't do any more prevention uh, measures, we'll really go really fast before we know it. Right. Okay. And then what about your partner? I, I said a seven. I also said that to, uh, to my partner here that I'm much older than her and I'm more optimistic. So I live longer. <laughs> right. Okay. Great. Just very quickly some others. Any other? What about over here? I gave five and you said we can only have one word. So yep. my one word was China. China. Okay. And what about your partners? Four. Okay. What about, what about up here? Just get a quick cross section. I missed the question. <laughs> okay. Well, how about behind you? What was this? I said uh, four. Four? Yeah. And I said this, I don't know, I've traveled a lot and I've seen a lot of things and I don't I have like a 200 pair of dollar sunglasses. I went to Honduras last summer and like kids don't have food. So okay. That's what I look at. Disparities? Yeah. If I were to pick a word, and what would you give? Basically the same thing. Same thing? What was your number? Three. Three. Okay. And how about back, just to round it out, what about back there? Any volunteers? Yep. Six. I went incremental. Okay. And what about your partner? I said five, and I said it's not a priority. Not a priority. Okay. I ask this question everywhere I go. I'm partly collecting data, <laughs> and partly uh, so we can have a conversation. I would tell you. Almost every room I go to around the world, the average answer is about a four. Most people feel that it's not the worst and it's not the best. It's kind of in between, but it's usually a, closer to a four than a five. There are more sevens in this room than often because it also feels like something's not going right. There's a deep sentiment that's palpable around the world, that is not going right. And so today I want to talk with you about what's happening and how we can understand this in a big picture way. But I also want to make an argument and we can discuss it. I think we're in the greatest period of progress in history. The problem is the challenges are bigger than the progress we're making. And that's what I want to talk about. And I'm going to do a bit of an experiment because I, uh, I set myself a challenge here of talking about what's happened in the world since the turn of the millennium. So we're going to blow through very quickly a lot of stuff. But please stop me if something doesn't make sense, but I'm hoping that we can blow through this and at various points well, I'll open it up so we can have like a, a check-in with the group. Does that sound good? You guys ready for the experiment? Okay. So why is it maybe different from a four? Well, imagine it's 1999. Go back to that year. Now I have some friends, this is all they can think about. Prince, party like it's 1999. Some of you were probably pretty young back in 1999, if you're in university now. This is what it felt like. For a lot of people around the world, this is 1999. These are some young girls I was with in uh, rural Ethiopia. This, nothing's really going on. Or this young boy in Uganda. What does his day look like? Well, him and his father and his brothers and his sisters, they just, they collect water every day. That's what they do. And when you're back in 1999, if you were to look at global extreme poverty, this is the best data we have. This is the percentage of people from 1990 to 1999 is the reference point who are living on less than so-called dollar a day, dollar 25 a day. This is the absolute poorest of the poor. And you can see it's kind of going down, but it's not really changing. That's how the world looked in 1999. It also, this is aid as a share of national income for Canada, 
the US and the UK. Canada is in red, the UK is in green, US is in blue. All you have to know here is that they're all going down. So poverty was basically flatlined and the world was in decline in how it tackled these problems. A lot of people were upset. This is a photo from the cover of Time magazine in December of 1999, after the so-called battle in Seattle. After the Asia crisis of the late 1990s, when uh, the US government, the World Bank, the IMF were all going in, kind of giving strictures on the countries, Indonesia's GDP dropped by 20% within a year. The protests were so strong that the world was unfair that the WTO actually had a meeting in Seattle and they had to cancel it midway through because the protests on the street were so strong. The world, as it entered this famous turn of the calendar, felt like it was breaking. It certainly wasn't fair. And that was when a very special person, Kofi Annan, was Secretary General. And he, uh, at the time, he had come out of a very quiet, uh, diplomatic, civil servant existence, had his tribulations, he was in charge of peacekeeping during the Rwanda genocide. It was a very tough period in global history. He had become Secretary General, and he had become a true star and a moral leader for the world. And he said, well, let's use this turn of the calendar to have a new type of conversation about how we get organized and how we can at least tackle this divergent path around the world, but do it with a sense of historic gathering. And they did, and this is the United Nations, this is a real photo, when they had the Millennium Summit in September of 2000. The time was the largest ever gathering of world leaders. And they got together. This is all of them. And you can see, if you will, if this, uh, here's Kofi Annan, Bill Clinton, Chirac, Tony Blair, Jean Chrétien is right there. Some of them are still there. Putin hasn't changed. Jiang Zemin. They got together though and they set an agenda. And they set these things called the Millennium Development Goals. And at the time, this was at least a political statement to say, well, let's do better. And who here knows what the Millennium Development Goals are just by a show of hands? Who here feels they could recite the Millennium Development Goals if you were asked to list them off? <laughs> a couple. So these are a thing that were these diplomatic commitments that even in this august body of people who study these things and think about these things for a living are a little bit mysterious. People have heard of them, but we don't really know what they mean or certainly what they've done. And so that's a little bit what I want to talk about today is how do we understand what they've done? How do we understand, more importantly, what we, as a world, have done? So I want to break that down into a variety of very simple issues. What the Millennium Development Goals did was they set a bunch of targets for 2015, which at the time felt like a very long ways away. It feels about as far away as 2030 does today. Who can think that far ahead? But they said, let's basically cut extreme poverty by half by 2015. Let's cut child mortality by two thirds. Let's get all the kids in primary school. Roughly, roughly speaking, they said all these problems of exclusion and the world not working for the poorest people, let's at least cut it by half by 2015. Now, one of the really important things though is it said, what's extreme poverty? How do you define poverty? Well, the economist would say what? What would, what would you guess an economist would say? Income. 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 What would a doctor say? Health. Health. What would a teacher say? 
Education. What would an engineer say? Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Right. And the basic point is that they're all right. And so what the goals did was they provided a shorthand for these different dimensions of poverty. Poverty is not just one thing. Poverty is many things. And so today I want to talk very briefly, given the complexity, about a handful of the realities and practicalities of those things. The first, and I would say the most important, because it is the thing without which we get nothing else, is matters of life and death. If you're not alive, you're, that's the greatest test of poverty there is. You've died because you couldn't afford to stay alive. If your child dies because you're too uh, poor to afford a medicine or there was no clinic or medicine available, that's an ultimate, unambiguous, bottom line measure of poverty, one we can all agree on. We might debate on whether a dollar a day is enough, or two dollars a day is enough, or ten dollars a day is enough, but I'm pretty sure that everyone in the world can agree that their kid shouldn't die. And that's one of the absolute most important metrics. But back in 2000, it was even then a little more complicated than that. Back in 2000, the adults were dying in large numbers too. The AIDS pandemic had in some ways come out of nowhere. What hadn't at all come out of nowhere, but in terms of political consciousness. And when I started in this line of work, really around the turn of the millennium, it's about 25 million people infected. It's about two to three million people dying every year. And do you know how many people the international community was supporting to stay alive? Zero. Absolutely none. And this was deemed at the time a problem that's actually too hard even to solve. Antiretrovirals, the medicine that keeps people alive, had only been released to the world in 1996. So it was like, as of today, as if the medicine was just discovered in 2010. So recent. And people said, you know, this, these places have nothing. Very famously, the head of the US development program at the time said, these people in Africa, most of them were in Africa, they can never tell Western time, they'll never be able to follow a drug regimen. You'll actually cause more problems by trying to treat them than by letting it go. So the official program was actually bereavement support and uh, trying to you know, prevent transmission while those couple million people died every year. That was the world. This is the number of millions of people on antiretrovirals as things started, started to get going. So in 2000, you had you know, roughly uh, 10,000 people on treatment, most of them in Southern Africa because they could get uh, private support for it. 2001, this was the launch of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, Malaria. 2002, you had a couple hundred thousand. 2003, very surprising to everyone, President George Bush in the State of the Union, January 2003, the Compassionate Conservative launches the US AIDS Control Program. There were about 400,000 people on treatment at the time. So they said, well, let's scale this up. President Clinton, under his reign, nothing happened. Under President Bush, it started. But then it got a little more interesting. A person who is a professor at Harvard, Jim Kim, who now happens to be the president of the World Bank. At the time, he was a professor of medicine and anthropology, and he was co-founder with Paul Farmer, something called Partners in Health. He went to the WHO, the World Health Organization, and they said, at the time, there were, we thought, the world thought that six million people needed AIDS treatment. That was the best bet. And he said, and we, he was very involved with the Millennium Development Goals, said, let's at least cut that by half by 2005. So this was known as three by five. And at the time, a lot of people complained because this was too ambitious, never gonna work. They didn't ask for permission. All the official governments were quite upset because they didn't come and check to say, can we do this? He just said, let's announce a target of three by five. So how did they do? By 2005, 
they weren't even halfway to the goal. 1.4 million. And this is a really big question, and it's one we're going to confront a lot next year as we approach this Millennium Development Goal deadline. Is this a success or a failure? You can see the headlines. You can see the critique, oh, there goes the United Nations with some lofty target, never going to happen. They can't even get halfway there. What a bunch of twits. I would argue this is the greatest success of the 21st century so far in terms of global coordination. Why? Who knows what the treatment coverage rate is today? Any guesses? You know, at least one person knows. It's over 10 million. What happened? It wasn't just about reaching the target. It was about taking the target seriously. And it was about delivering all the programs to meet the target. And every six months, they were reporting on how close they were to the target. Because instead of saying, we need to do better, let's do more, they said, there are six million people who need treatment. Let's at least get half of them. And then lo and behold, boom, it's now expanding by more than a million people a year. But wait a sec, I thought the goal was six million. Why are there 10? Interesting thing. As you start doing something and it moves from abstract reality to specific, you learn. And one of the things that was learned is that more people needed treatment than we thought. And the academics were very involved in this, measuring something called the CD4 counts, the immunity uh, system, the immune system. And they realized we should be using a different uh, threshold for when people's immune systems qualify them for AIDS treatment. And now we think it's actually closer to 15 million people who need it. But this has gone from, in the course of just a little more than a decade, a problem that's too hard to solve to, oh, we're now more than twice as far as we were when we thought this was impossible. And this is probably one of the areas of the most straightforward agreement in the world these days. Everyone who needs treatment should get it in a decade. This then opened up the challenge for simpler problems. This is a photo of a bunch of children in Malawi. That photo actually has a very famous uh, historical story to it in terms of the role it played in motivating a lot of people. But these are children in a malaria coma in Malawi before there was malaria treatment. I can't say for sure but most of these that they actually died, but most of these kids are about to die. This was normal. It's happened to about one to two million kids a year. We didn't even know how many at the time because we weren't really tracking. But after this age thing started to get under control, which was too hard, people started to say, well, wait a sec, malaria, which has been around forever, you know, we can do things not for malaria yet, but we can think about a vaccine as a scientific goal, but we can certainly think about bed nets and treatment because actually no one literally needs to die from malaria. It's an absolutely curable disease. It's not 100% preventable, but so far it's 100% curable. But then the vaccine stuff was getting off the ground and people said we can immunize everyone. And we know about polio immunization very famously. We know about diphtheria, tetanus. Well then, as people started to say, well, let's build this out, new vaccines started to get developed. And even people started to say, let's put in place the money to pay for the vaccines once they're ready. Even before they're ready, let's commit. And the governments and Margaret Biggs, who's here, and others were working on, let's make sure that we can at least pay for it once they're ready. This is simple. And solving this big hard problem of AIDS made it actually pretty simple to solve these other problems only because people thought differently. And the result, 
And this, I'm sorry if you can't see it very clearly, but the result, this is millions of under five deaths per year. And it's 12 million at the top there, 13 million, it's five below. And this is the rate, the dark line of how many people have died every year. And what we see is that in, if we were to go at the rate of the 90s, it would have been like this. In the late 90s, it started to speed up a little bit. And if we kept that rate, it would have looked like this. But in the end, it looked like this. And there's one thing I should say, there's a trick in these graphs, which is when the line is straight, that means progress is accelerating. Just the way the math works of proportionate declines. If you cut by half every year, you go from 100 to 50 to 25 to 12 and a half to six, it actually flattens out. So this straight line is accelerating. If you just look at this number of lives here, in that triangle, the number that have been saved, it's about seven and a half million lives that have been saved. More than would have been saved otherwise. That's a lot of kids. Through very, very simple things. Now this does bring up, very quickly, this question of what people presume is happening. Yeah? Just a question, when under five mortality goes down that dramatically, and does that chart factor in um, uh, population rates or birth rates in the same country? It looks even better if you look at a share of birth rates. Mm -hmm. And I'll just flag, because this is a question that people often wonder is, well, if you, people are often embarrassed to ask the following question, which is, if we save more kids, doesn't that worsen the problem of overpopulation? It actually doesn't, it's the opposite. Because <laughs> the more kids survive, the more people invest per child. And so actually it's one of the central elements of getting population growth under control, so to speak, is making sure kids survive. Known that since the vaccination drives in the yeah. But there are three other big myths that come up here about what's happened in global development. And one is that it was all happening anyways. And you hear this a lot, actually. And econ I'm an economist by training. A lot of my colleagues will make this argument. It's actually not true. Everything that's happening was happening anyways. Well, this shows it was not an extension of the trend. But it's actually a little deeper than that. The, the data that we have go back to 1950. And this is a, a paper I just recently put out. This is a graph which is a test of, are the countries that are poor doing better or worse than the countries that are rich? Or specifically, technically, the countries with high mortality, are they doing better or worse than the countries with low mortality? And what this graph shows is it, if all countries are doing the same in terms of their rate of progress, no matter how rich they are, these dots should be along the zero line. Zero meaning there's zero difference. The dot is the coefficient, the line is the standard error. But what this shows is that for 50 years, everything's below the zero line. This is a result of a statistical test. And for 50 years, the poorer you were, the worse you were doing. Doing at what? Reducing child mortality. Thank you. And so that's the essence of what's called divergence. If the world was convergent, if living standards were coming together, everything would be above the zero line. And what you see is, as far back as we can go in the data, it was divergent until around 2000. And here it starts to show the seeds of this bar has to be above the zero line in order to count statistically. But it looks strongly suggestive that we've at least at a minimum ended the divergence and we're getting close to convergence. It's one of the biggest structural changes in history. No matter where you are, you've basically got an equal shot at progress. Not yet at outcomes, but at least at progress. That's a big, big deal. That's like a tectonic shift in global living standards. But the other side is everyone says, well, it's all Asia, it's all China, it's all India. They're doing it for everyone. 
That's actually not true either. The countries that have seen the biggest acceleration, three quarters of the lives saved are in Africa. East Asia as well, this is just the amount that's extra, that's accelerated. East Asia is actually accelerated too, and so is South Asia, really India, Bangladesh. But most every part of the world has accelerated. The one part that hasn't actually is Latin America. Latin America has slowed down. But it's a teeny bit from a much higher rate of progress. So second myth is it's all China and India. Well, it's not actually. The biggest change is in Africa. And then the third is this point, well, it's all incomes anyhow. It's, this is all just the economy. There's a whole very technical answer to that, which I'm not going to get into. But this is just the annual rate of progress from 1990 to 2000. The dark line is the rich countries, high income. This top line is the middle income countries. And the bottom line, this is the low income countries. And what you see is that the high income countries and the middle income countries, they were all doing awesome, relatively speaking. For some reason, which we don't really know, around the turn of the millennium, the high income countries slowed down a bit, making about 2% progress a year instead of four. But the developing countries in every region go up to around 4% a year. And if I were to make this graph region by region, it looks like an uh, inverted fan. All, all regions are going up this way to the same rate of progress. It's never happened before. So that's health. We've gone through this incredible change in experiences of life and death around the world. I want to talk quickly about food, because that helps keep us alive. Why else is food important? Why is farming important? Yep. When your food production is high enough to go above sustenance levels, you can move on to other things and specialize in other areas. Exactly. The majority of the poorest people in the world, what do they do for a living? <coughs> they farm. So growing food is their business. I grew up in Vancouver. I'm a city slicker by birth. Many of us probably are. My grandparents were farmers. My dad grew up on a farm. I grew up in a city. I did not understand this. I was not taught this. This was not batted into me when I was learning about these issues. Most of the world's poorest people, you know, kind of live, this is a slightly cynical cartoon, so I don't love it, but, uh, you know, are living in the kind of the shadow of what is, of course, an obesity epidemic, <laughs> true in the rich countries, and increasingly in the middle-income countries. But the poverty and hunger and even conflict issues are so deeply interwoven that we have to understand that food plays a very special role in development. For most people, and I'm going to talk a bunch about Africa, this is what farming looks like. You know, it's women who do a lot of the food farming. It's you know, truly manual labor. There's no tractors, there's no machines, there's usually not even an animal to help pull the hoe. It's them, and they're doing it by hand. Now this woman happens to be lucky because she has fertilizer, and this is what economic growth looks like to a farmer. On the right you have, this is like bad seed, no fertilizer. Here is good seed, lots of fertilizer. This is corn. For a large part of the poorest, uh, the poorest countries in the world, a large number, this is the difference between low income and high income. It's very physical. I just want to tell a quick story exactly on the point you made. This is in a place in Malawi, Mwandama, Malawi. And this is a building which was built uh, about seven years ago now. And eight, I think. And this, was the, this is the tallest building in the land, so to speak. They built this as a grain warehouse. And everyone said, that's crazy. This is right after Malawi had been called the perfect storm because they had AIDS, they had malaria, they had famine after famine after famine. They were next to a civil war in Mozambique. This is like the worst place to be born if you want to roll the dice. And so these guys said, no, we're going to give fertilizer and seeds out to our farmers 
er, support them. And uh, we're going to build a warehouse because we know that they need to have enough place to store it. Crazy talk. Just as crazy as thinking you could treat AIDS. This is inside the warehouse. Forgive the dorky picture of me. This is me with the chief, and this is what it looks like inside at the end of the harvest now. This thing is full to the rafters with maize because they were able to make that transition from junk maize, like low crop yield, to high crop yield, and they were able to store it. Now, part of that is the story of more food. And that's a really important point because actually even that part was in effect disallowed by the international system for about 20 years. This is a quote from a somewhat famous World Bank independent evaluation report that only came out in 2007, which said agriculture has been neglected, including by the World Bank, and the results have been limited because of limited availability of inputs like fertilizer and water. This is not super technical stuff. Very, very basic. This was seven years ago. That matters for the food, but it matters for another reason. If you go back to this, and this same day, it was, I took these photos the same day. I was inside with the village chief. I came out here, took this photo with the local team that was running this place. And then I'd been here before, and then I was walking out. And then just outside there, I saw this woman with her daughter in a little store. And I said, that wasn't there before. And I stopped to talk to her, and it was Anifa, and I said, Anifa, what happened here? She said, well, my husband and I, we had extra crop. We were actually able to grow more cabbages, and we were able to open this store. So you see in the store there are soaps, lotions, little things here. This is that first stage of economic development. They were able to save enough to invest and diversify into another income stream. I don't know whether this business still exists. It might have gone bust. There's lots of things that can happen. This isn't a guarantee of success. The market speaks. But this is that first step in the ladder of economic development. That's why food is so important. It allows you to both feed yourself, but also to save and invest. And what we've seen, this is just the global investment. The green is in health. We've seen this major takeoff in the late 90s, health and agriculture were around the same. Health has increased, and it's actually even gone further than that, about fourfold in the past 15 years. Agriculture has roughly doubled, but it's nowhere near the same place. We've kind of had a minor renaissance in food and food systems, but it's a very partial one still. But that gets us to income. What about income? Well, let's go back to that extreme poverty. And if I had done this just for Africa, it actually would have gone up during this period. This is the global one. Well, if you look at the world, you see it's actually, if you go from 1990, it's already been cut by half. And as of next year, according to my colleague who measures this stuff for a living, as of next year, probably, even once you take China out of the equation, it will have dropped by half, too. We've had, actually, an incredible success of economic development everywhere around the world. And again, this deep point, this is divergence versus convergence. This is how many times richer North America is than each other region in the world. So this is if. North America is five times richer. This is 10 times richer, 15, 20, 25. The red is Africa. The yellow is South Asia. The green is East Asia. The blue is Latin America. See, Latin America and North America, roughly the same ratio throughout. In the 90s, East Asia, it's the Asia crisis. It was getting worse for a while. South Asia, not much progress then. And Africa was doing terribly. 25 times as rich we were at the time. But what do you see? Asia actually, South and East Asia, sped up dramatically. And even Africa has turned the corner towards convergence in incomes. It's an incredible success story in terms of which way the plates are moving of the global economy and the tectonics of it all. Now, we're still 20 times richer. That means they're 1 20th our income. So this is not a solved problem. But this is a massive directional shift. 
And we're actually on track, this is the World Bank's latest projections, the dotted line, to get very close to, 20, to zero by 2030. Not at zero, but very close. We're actually on the brink of eliminating extreme poverty. It's unconscionable, or not unconscionable, it was difficult to imagine, pardon me, in the late 1990s. What's the threshold for extreme poverty? This is the dollar twenty-five a day measure, which is about to get revised. Uh, but this is so-called dollar twenty-five a day. Now, one of the implications of this is that this is if you were to look at how the world is divided between low-income, middle-income, and high-income countries. So, and some of us were talking about this earlier today. In two thousand and one, there were technically twenty-two high-income countries that were rich donor countries, there were about 65 low-income countries, and then there was about half of them were middle-income countries. This was kind of the, the divided pie of the world economy. Today, it's more like a Pac-Man. Most of the world actually is in middle-income countries. The low-income countries have shrunk dramatically, and the high-income countries have expanded. So most of the world, if you think about what's happening in the world, if you were a Martian and you like threw a dot on the planet, odds are you're gonna land in a middle income country that's growing at a reasonable rate and that is facing a lot of new challenges that didn't exist a generation ago. We're the exception here. Now, a flip side of this, this is just to point it out, it points out what's happening in these economies. Now you've all heard about the 1%. I just took the liberty of adding up the numbers a couple years ago. This is total USAID from 2012, 2000, 2012, compared to total Wall Street bonuses for the same period. It's almost the same number. That's the country's official budget versus uh, a small sector of one state and its economy. Now, I'm not beating up on Wall Street here. I'm just comparing the flows because I can beat up on Wall Street, but that's not what I'm doing right here. Because there's also been a change in terms of the role of private giving. And this isn't just Bill Gates. Everyone thinks that Bill Gates is roughly 15% with Warren Buffett of US giving. But you see, this is the green is the US official assistance, roughly doubling, and the yellow is the private assistance. And what we've seen is a huge growth of entrepreneurship underneath this as well. There are many more small businesses, small NGOs, uh, doing all sorts of creative things to motivate new people to do new things. And there's a lot more philanthropists, too. Now this gets us to the environment, which is this other big global challenge. I just want to bring it back to you guys for a moment. Grab the person on your other side. And what does the global environment mean to you? If you were to just take 10 seconds, like what jumps to mind if you think about global environment? Go. You can triangle it if you want. Yeah, we can be inclusive. Okay. Environment, I mean like ecosystems, nature. That type of environment? Hmm? That type of environment? Yeah. Physical environment. I think awareness. Okay. What do you guys think? This thing is biodiversity. Biodiversity? You know, the fact that it's not just how clean it is, it's how many animals can actually sustain right. a living there. You guys? Mm. Very good. All right, let's bring it back. So just by quick volunteers, what came up? What are the, some of the things that came up? Do you guys want to just sit, repeat what you just said? Two very different things in the back row. Um, I'll talk about biodiversity and the capacity to sustain life, not necessarily human. Yep, and what was yours? Urban planning versus rural planning. Yep. Any others? 
Scarcity of water, yeah? I was part of that. Total inertia and lack of leadership. Okay. Inertia and lack of leadership. Any other? What did you guys think about? Yeah. I took a uh, I said water quality, not necessarily quality, but quality. Dirty air, dirty water. Dirty air, dirty water. Again, yes. <laughs> Big, complicated, multi-layered issues, right? Now, how do we think about this systematically? The simplest answer is we don't yet have a way to do so. This is a, a picture made by a group out of Stockholm trying to define planetary boundaries. And it's a scientific concept that the world can only manage so much as a closed system. Ultimately, the world, the planet, is a closed system. And there are boundaries to that system. And it includes things like uh, climate change, which surprisingly no one mentioned. But it also includes things like ozone depletion, freshwater use, land use, atmospheric aerosol, chemical pollution, biodiversity loss, nitrogen cycle, which is linked to fertilizer use. And they've started to map these out. How bad is each issue compared to what the best bet scientifically the planet can hold? And if it's really far out red, this is like disaster zone. And if it's in the middle, it's actually maybe not so bad yet. So ozone depletion, there's a bit of red there, but it's not, it's not actually at the planetary boundary, this argument goes. Biodiversity, way out of control. Nitrogen cycle, nitrogen being primary element of fertilizers, not so good. Freshwater, not actually as bad. And then these things like chemical pollution, atmospheric aerosol loading, not even yet quantified. Don't even have a good measure. Why do I show this slide? Because the environment is probably the one area where the world has done the worst in managing itself. And actually even, because the issues are really complicated, in understanding itself. And there are tremendous, that's not a criticism of the scientists, because there are a lot of brilliant scientists pushing the frontiers on this, but I want to understand, these are complicated issues that we don't have the tools yet even to set the right targets for, we can all say pretty straightforwardly there should be no extreme poverty, no kids should die, but we're not actually 100% sure, in my view, on what's the exact best rate of freshwater extraction. It's a very difficult problem. Flipping here. Now, we do know some things, though. This is, I recently calculated how much the agricultural land area has been expanded in a bunch of countries in Africa. This is the percent expansion in the country. Each of these has expanded by at least 2 million hectares. A hectare is uh, 100 meters by 100 meters uh, since 2000. So Angola, Tanzania, Mozambique, they're all basically in 10 years alone, they've expanded their land area planted by 50%. So you can think of that as deforestation, roughly speaking, on the other side. That's the flip side of two things. One is not enough agricultural productivity, so people just clear more land to grow more food. It's also the fact that other parts of the world are investing because they want to grow food there too. It's, it's actually a very difficult problem. Urban planning was raised. This is a photograph, satellite photo, of the Pearl River Delta where Hong Kong, Shenzhen is, and so forth. This is 1990, it's about seven million people. This is 2010, 25 million people. This is a major urban planning and environmental set of issues. This is, of course, temperature change over a century, climate change. You see the polar warming, you see that where it's brighter red, it's more warming. But then you actually see the opposite, which is number of vertebrates, biodiversity loss. If it's darker, it's worse, both in the oceans and on land, all throughout the tropics. Massive biodiversity loss all around the world. And then you have this problem of flooding. These people move to cities. There's more climate change. They're not quite rich enough environments to have a lot of infrastructure. And this is, uh, in effect, uh, 
millions of people affected. If it's a circle this size, it's a million. This is the number of deaths in the orange, and this is kind of tens of millions of people affected. You have flooding as number one economic and social risk for much of Asia now. We saw it in the Philippines last year, it's a great devastation. This is a major issue. And of course, this is New York, a couple blocks from where I used to live after Hurricane Sandy. This is everywhere. So it brings us to Canada. What does this mean for us? Well, this is Canada's aid, and some of you saw this. I gave, showed a similar picture when I was here in May. This is, the red is under a liberal or labor government, and the blue is under a conservative or progressive conservative government, and the green is the 0 0.7 line. And what you see is that Canada and the UK started the decade around here, and UK is now a global leader, and Canada has not changed in terms of where it stands in the world and how much it's investing in these issues. And this is just a picture of conversation. It's a measure of how much the Millennium Development Goals are even mentioned in three different newspapers. The Globe and Mail, the Financial Times of London, and the Guardian. And all you need to see is there's no real com competition. We're not even really talking about these issues publicly. And the conversations, though, have changed. So the conversations, this is 2000. 2005, some of you might remember, we had big concerts around the world, let's make it a public issue, rally the troops. 2008, this is at Davos, the World Economic Forum, you have business leaders, heads of state, Bill Gates, Bono, President of Nigeria, Gordon Brown. But today, this is a people conversation. This is not just about governments, this is about people. And everyone in the world is now connected in a conversation. That means it's more exciting, it also means it's harder. And that's why uh, I wanna just end on this point. We're used to thinking about what are they gonna do? And there's an election next year, so that's a big conversation. What are they gonna do? They have jobs to do, they have to deliver. But I want us to focus a lot on this part of the conversation. Not just what's gonna happen inside, but what's gonna happen outside. Because all of these breakthroughs that I've talked about today, some of them were led by these type of people, rightly. A lot of them were led by these types of people. And that's our challenge. And when we think about each of these issues, you know, we can get very depressed about climate change. Well, people used to get very depressed about the AIDS pandemic. People just get very depressed about poverty. All of these problems are solvable. But they don't get solved by someone. They get solved by us. And in this country, a few of us were talking about this this morning, the universities actually have a really important role to play in helping us understand these issues and also the students and the professors in helping to explain these issues. And that's what I think the challenge is of the next generation. So we have three simple tasks to take on. One is to eliminate extreme poverty. One is to ensure inclusive societies where the inequalities are not unmanageable. And the third is just to protect our planet. That's all we have to do. So it's for us to figure out how to do it. Thank you. Thanks so very much. Uh, we do have some time. Thank you. We do have some time uh, for questions. And uh, I just want to remind everyone of our house rules, uh, which are uh, please identify yourself. Uh, please wait for the microphone since we we're recording this. And um, we, want to, we don't have that much time, so please don't give a big long speech. Et si vous avez des questions en français, il me ferait plaisir de la traduire en anglais. Si c'est nécessaire. Si c'est nécessaire. <laughs> so who wants to ask the first question? 
All right, thanks for your talk. Very optimistic, very good. Uh, my name is James Cohen. I'm an independent development consultant. Um, I'm wondering where you land on where does governance fall into helping progress? Because you can say it depends on the people, not on the politicians, but in the countries undergoing the change. How much is it really like a political issue if the politics could be solved, which is hard in itself, that a lot more progress could be made? General answer is there's no question that governance matters and it's fundamental. Uh, my view though is let's unpack that. So what does governance mean? Uh, we have many, even in so-called fragile states, uh, if I were to show you that picture of the child mortality, major progress in accelerations of child survival. Uh, why is that? Well, even in the toughest places of the world, we know how to deliver immunizations, we know how to get bed nets out. The governance is about service delivery. Now that's a different question of governance from uh, democratic accountability, which is about the right to vote, who chooses who's in power. That's different from questions of uh, fiscal management and dollar responsibility. So my general view, and governance is a very tricky question globally because each country as a sovereign right has the jurisdiction to define its own governance system. And so we have to respect that while we can responsibly advocate universal principles. And ultimately the universal principle I, human rights, fundamental. Part of what we're talking about is giving life to human rights, like the right to live. Another part of it, though, is ultimately transparency, which is, uh, I think, the universal building block for governance, which is, do you, say, do you do what you say you're gonna do? And if any money changes hands, is it used for the purpose for which it's been agreed? And so from there, I think if we can get a global agreement on that, which most people agree on, I think we can build actually a much better approach to governance, which is much better than lectures of why don't you have this political system. That's a super short version to a very complicated <laughs> question. Yeah. Maybe we can take a couple if there's a couple, yeah. Uh, hi, Catherine McKenna. So I teach a course called Global, Global Civil Society at the Monk School, but I also wear another hat, uh, which is kind of hopefully on the left side, uh, which I'm, I'm the liberal candidate for uh, federally for Ottawa Center. And I hope you didn't talk about this at the beginning because I had to be, I was a little bit late, but I, I am interested in what you think government should be doing. What role can Canada play? And beyond, I mean, maybe you'll say it's 0.7 and we should be aiming for that, but beyond that, where does Canada, I mean, what are the needs and where does Canada have, you know, expertise that can actually be useful? I just wrote a little paper on this, so it'll be out soon with my own thoughts, but uh you know, government has multiple roles as a voice on setting the global agenda. That's, so this coming year, there is a global negotiation on the, so what are being called so far the sustainable development goals. What are the actual targets through to 2030? Canada and 192 other members of the United Nations will agree on that. It's a crucial role to set an ambitious, practical agenda that speaks to Canadians, and my view is government has a responsibility to help engage Canadians on that. My view is that that should be a discussion in the national election for all parties to say, here's what we think. Uh, but certainly the government, whoever it is, uh, has to say, you know, here's our commitments to the global agenda, and that, that's a crucial bit. In terms of once that's agreed, there is a second piece which is, I say to work backwards from the global issues to how Canada fits in, rather than what is Canada doing and how does it uh, course correct. It's a very different thought process. So looking at these global issues, there should be, this is where the groups like the G20 and all the other uh, groups of the world matter, where they can say, Canada's taken a leadership role, for example, on maternal and child health at least on the agenda setting, not necessarily financially. Uh, it's taken a uh, leadership role on certain elements like vital statistics. It's a really big contribution, kind of a pinpoint thing. That is great. It should, I'd like it to be more, but it's great to say, here are things we're working with our partners. We're gonna take on this role as a complement, not a substitute, we're pieces of the puzzle. And then I think as part of this uh, broader sustainable development agenda, there are things around mobilizing businesses and academics 
and civil society with the right incentives so that they're engaging. So there should be, in my view, competitive research grants for Canadian researchers to take on global issues, make recommendations, do science and research. There should be the right incentives for Canadian firms to help provide the private sector portion of some of these big solutions, not uh, payouts, but incentives for where they aren't now. How can we crowd business in? And then crucially, you know, how can uh, the government make the medium to long-term financial commitments that both earn a seat at the table and pay our fair share? So the 0.7 commitment is often misunderstood as, uh, well, let's just throw money at this or what have you. It's not that. <laughs> It should be, in a sense, the culmination of a national strategy which engages the best parts of all society to you know, help solve the problems, because that's what we, ultimately all we care about is the problems. Uh, hi. <coughs> uh, my name is Roland. I'm a student here at Ottawa. So this question is kind of for me and for other students, some of whom I, I see here. Uh, it can be daunting to sort of be graduating now and thinking, okay, we want to go enter the world and contribute positively, create change and work for development. Uh, so just in your opinion, sort of where, what advice would you give to students in terms of where to gain skills and expertise? Which, is it universities? Is it, is it entering politics? Is it being positive players in a business community? Is it NGOs abroad? Is it here? Like, where is it most necessary to, to have people trying to create change? That's a great question. I think the, everyone has their own Venn diagram, right? Start, what are you passionate about? Follow your passions. Every young person should. Uh, second, you know, what's a problem that you can help solve? Uh, so, you know, we might be passionate about a problem that's already getting solved or that, you know, we can't help with. So you want that overlap. But then there's the question of where to do it. So each of those is a piece of the puzzle that only an individual can answer for themselves. But that's the sequence in which I would suggest approaching it. A lot of people go the other way. They say, oh, I always want to work at the UN, or I've always wanted to do this. And I actually suggest to flip that, because it might be that the UN isn't the place that's solving the problems that you want to work on. It might be there's another entrepreneurial place or a more effective place or you know, really start that way. And then I think, though that being said, uh, there's general rules around, you know, first do no harm. <laughs> you know, start with listening uh, wherever you are. Uh, second, depending on your stage of life, I think there's a lot around uh, research which a lot of people can add to in university-based environments can add a lot to, to just understand, build the evidence. And there even the incentives have to be research to solve problems rather than research to impress your colleagues. Uh, that's actually more of a, an issue than one might think sometimes. Uh, but then the other bit is, you know, in the business world, there are more and more of these things that are being developed through new entrepreneurial approaches. And the great thing about the shrinking number of low-income countries, as much as those are, in my view, a, a moral and strategic imperative for the world, there's all these other places that have markets that are taking off with all sorts of room for creativity. And there, the only test is the market. So does someone buy it or not? Does someone pay for it or not? You might have a great idea, but no one wants to pay for it. You've got your answer. So I think some people like that approach to life. Some people are uncomfortable with it. Each of those can be, I think, a nice approach. Okay, thank you. Fellow Vancouverite, by the way. Ex-Vancouverite. Um, never, never X, never. please. I'm in permanent exile here in Ottawa. <laughs> I'm, uh, my name is John Curtis. I'm obviously founding chief economist in foreign affairs trade now development as well. Um, innovation, a lot of what you have been talking about in effect is the result of innovation. How do you see it going on worldwide on sort of common, the common pol public policy problems such as say energy efficiency, right. cancer, some of these other things, is it uh, private partnerships, is it primarily the public sector, where do you see it coming from? So I'll you know, just, for example, I, this is one of my favorite pictures, is the Swanson effect. You know, this is the photovoltaic price coming down. Uh, just I happen to have it as a backup here where 
you know, the, basically the, the rule of thumb is that every doubling of the capacity brings the price down, or the shipping amount of photovoltaics brings the price down 20%. So it's been coming down dramatically. That's innovation. That's part of what's going to solve the climate problem. Now, one question is where does innovation come from? You know, and what is the role of innovation? In some things, innovation is ultimately about cheaper ways to do things. Cheaper in terms of the number of people required, cheaper in terms of the number of dollars required, cheaper in terms of the amount of time required. All those things are forms of innovation. Part of what we need to do is make sure that these problems are as easy to solve as possible. <laughs> Part of what we also need to do is just scale up what we already know how to do. So the global AIDS problem right now, the five million or so people uh, who don't have treatment, that's not really an innovation problem. That's a delivery problem. The reason I say that is a lot of people like to use innovation as a crutch to avoid the scale issue, often because that's a way to try and skip the bill. That said, anytime you can find a way to get squeeze more out of every dollar, uh, find a new solution that maybe in some ways that like the cell phones, people will just buy, uh, that's great. And so there the deepest point is the policies around innovation have to be around public finance for basic science in all these core issues, from health science to energy science to agricultural science. It's a major, major issue. Those innovations come from somewhere, usually from a science pipeline, which starts in national research bodies. The second thing is you need, again, in my view, an approach, make it very easy for firms to start and stop. So you need opportunities, whether that's venture funding, regulatory frameworks, what have you, for people to try because innovation also means most things fail. And so there needs to be a very easy way for something to start and something to stop uh, if it could work and if it doesn't work. And not, no deep insights there. The biggest point though is, you know, make sure you don't skimp on the basic science that is the backbone of innovation and make sure you don't avoid the scale up, which is, uh, you know, what allows the innovations to get to market. Maybe one more or is there, yeah. Yeah. If, there are, if there are any more, I know we have to wrap, so if there's any others, we can just do them all okay. at once. But yeah. um, very quickly, it sounds like two questions, but it's linked by one word. Um, uh, one of the world's next big, or already uh, overdue big problems to solve is the fossil fuel dependency. And uh, I thought it was, I think many people realized how amazing it was that the Rockefellers who invested in oil all of a sudden have moved uh, all their money into renewable energy resources. I mean... Um, they moved out of fossil. Out of fossil and into renewables. Um, and that's a big issue for the economy. It's a big issue for climate change. It's a big issue for carbon, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of the things that uh, prevents that is, uh, in my view, my one link word is, is greed. A lot of money, a lot of people making a lot of money out of this, and they're driving the climate denier argument. The other big issue uh, that needs to be solved, you mentioned it, but I, um, I want to re-emphasize it because I think it's, it's frightening, and that is the equality gap and not just the globally, but within countries, and Canada's starting to go down that road. And the word there is greed. You know, the ones at the top have a, a view that, well, it's my money, I made it, uh, so I should get to keep it, and without realizing that, well, maybe they made it between 8 and 8.15 on the stock market, et cetera. And um, they didn't actually make it, but anyway. That's uh, another discussion. Do you see in, I like your positive approach. I think the world is getting better, by the way. I'm, I'm on that wavelength. Do you see the fossil fuel to renewable energy? Do you see the inequality to greater equality trends? Do you, are you, do you see those as big issues that 10, 15, 20 years from now, we can look back and recognize a tipping point? Nice, easy question to finish. <laughs> uh, just very quickly, and I'll, I'll happy to give my thoughts on that. Are there any other quick questions, especially the students, just to make sure everyone has a chance? 
Okay. Well, I think that you've ended with, you know, in a sense, the two arguably biggest problems uh, facing humanity. Uh, the thing I would say first is these are very complex problems. So as much as psychologically we might want simple descriptions, they're not. So, uh, you know, the, the inequality issue is not uh, all rich taking from poor. It's not. They're, uh, you know, the internet entrepreneurs make billions of dollars creating new products that people buy. Even if you think it's free, you're bought, you're, you know, there's a price there. And uh, that is a huge element of the uh, source of new wealth for many people. I'm from Vancouver. I couldn't afford to buy a house in Vancouver right now. Uh, for many reasons to do with the global economy and the shifts of the global economy. Uh, there are many things around globalization, uh, returns to skill premium, uh, availability of capital, uh, which ultimately require probably a new, ultimately, 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 a definition of the social contract. Because this, the social contracts of inequality aren't just domestic anymore, they're global. So many people are actually globalized, not just producers, but consumers. People are living in multiple countries at once. I somewhat do. I go back and forth between Canada and the US all the time. So this is a very interesting new generation question. How do you think through responsibilities across multiple jurisdictions? I actually can't vote in Canada today. I would like to. I can't vote anywhere today because I have had my residence outside of Canada for too long to be allowed to vote. As far as I know, unless the rules have been updated recently, because I've tried. That's weird, because I'm Canadian, but I worked in the international system outside of Canada. And so these are types of questions that we need to build new answers to on social contract. So I just, I think that this is a new frontier. The other thing I'd say on the energy, you know, yes, there is a certain amount of greed, no question. And that greed sometimes is nefarious, people trying to avoid responsibility. That greed is often an amazing motivator of people creating new things, new technologies, new entrepreneurs. Is Elon Musk greedy? I don't know. He's ambitious, which I'm thankful for, because he's developing all sorts of new technologies which are gonna help us solve these problems. Just like the solar graph is driven by a lot of people who wanna build new things, some of them wanna make money, some of them are motivated by solving big problems. The deepest thing is we need to change the relative prices. We need to find ways, and this is the policy question, to make the incentives for the good investments more attractive than the incentives for the bad investments. That's the deepest challenge, because there's so much capital sitting in places trying to invest right now, they will invest where the return comes, and we're seeing the philanthropic bodies wanting to use their balance sheet now, this is a new thing to make good investments. But the, the deepest question of the 10 to $15 trillion a year that gets invested around the world is, how do you make it easier to invest in the things that are good? And that's why a price of carbon, for example, really matters. So this is how I think about it. It's like the incentives to do good by being good. And that's the role for policy and ultimately why the social contract matters. John, I want to thank you so much for a great talk and a great question period. Been really interesting. I also want to thank you on a personal note for proving me correct. I uh, really appreciate that because I started out this talk saying that John MacArthur, I said there were four things that really struck me about John MacArthur. One was the breadth of his interests and expertise. Secondly, the intelligence of his analysis. Third, the pragmatism, yet the ambition of his work. And finally, the uh, irrepressible optimism. It's a very, very powerful combination. I've learned a lot from the talk today, and I'm pleased to report that my own personal rating of the state of the campaign on, uh, on extreme poverty has gone up from five to 6.5 as a result of this talk. So, uh, another hour and yeah, we that's right, we're on our way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, on behalf of all of us, thanks so much for a really excellent session. Thank, Thank you. you so much.